Do you have a big trip on your bucket list? Yes. What is it? Anywhere warm. Anywhere warm. I think we can handle that. Anyone else? I think if Pastor Tim had his way, it would be Israel. But I say if he's taken us, let's go. He's still here. If he commits to it, let's go. Okay, we're doing it. Awesome. Anyone else? Big trip. Have you already been on a bucket list style trip? Like one that's like, that's, I mean, I can't top it. I could only top it by going back. Mine, my big trip was Italy. And uh, I got to go five years ago with Kelsey and her family, with her Nona, with her mom and dad, and got to meet family members over there. Got to see where her grandparents grew up. Uh, Got to see where her mom grew up too. And we got to do some traveling and stuff. And it was awesome. I need to go back maybe this summer, hopefully. And uh, I I think um, there's so many memories. You know, I took thousands of pictures. And so I'm only going to show you about 180 of them today. But um, this is where I first started drinking espresso. (laughs) This is important. This explains a lot. (laughs) Jeremy was asking me if I already had one today. And I was like, yeah, do you know me? Uh, That was actually not my first one. That was my second one because I couldn't make it to that location. Uh, We flew into Venice and somewhere on the side of the road between Venice and Cavasso Novo, uh, we pulled over and it's great because it's only about like one euro for an espresso and anyone like from age about 12 up knows how to make it. And, uh, And so because they're smaller over there, you can have more of them. And so, anyway, that was uh, my second cup, not to be confused with the chain. Uh, But partway through the trip, we went to so many places, and it was awesome, but partway through, we got to go to Rome, and all the roads lead there, right? I I think they do anyway, at least that's the story. I loved it. I loved everything about Rome. I almost didn't have it, but I ended up, because my wife convinced me, I had the best lasagna of my life. If you have the chance, and if you love it, I think that's how God proves to me that he is real and that he loves me and his plans for me are, are just good. And anyway, I love lasagna, and I almost didn't get it because I didn't want to be disappointed. I wasn't. It was good. I got to see the Colosseum and other historical sites. It was, it was really um, an amazing thing. And uh, Kelsey's dad treated us to a tour of the Vatican, which I would highly recommend. Uh, It was amazing. We got to uh, uh, go to the Pope's garden before anyone else, and uh, that was when I just, that was an iPhone photo. We were just going through, and I'm like, that's cool. That's the basilica, you know, the the dome behind there. Um, One highlight I can't show you the picture of, because no photos or even talking was allowed, but has anyone been to the Sistine Chapel? Do you know what that is? Yeah, it's amazing. I wish... If someday I was able to, I would love to pay enough to be like everyone else out. I just want to lay on the floor and look up. It's incredible. But they just, you know, silence, silencia, they just keep you going through and you're not allowed to take your uh, camera out just in case it ruins something Michelangelo did. I don't know. Anyway, um, I didn't get to see the Pope. I did get to see his little porch. And uh, he wasn't there that day. But for breakfast that morning, like he, he has a dairy farm, right? I did get to have his yogurt, and holy cow, was it good. (laughs) Brad? Brad? It's iffy. I know Brad's the the standard, but uh, no, I did. It was so good. Look at it. He made that. Anyway, St. Peter's Basilica. Fun fact, it's the the tallest and largest dome in the world, and I I took a picture from inside looking up, and it kind of looks like gears. I think that's beautiful. Um, Anyway, and I got to go to pretty much the highest part. There was a part where you you actually have to like kind of tilt as you're going around a staircase. Uh, You have to hold on to a rope. I think that's when Kelsey bailed. She's like, no, no, it's not for me. See ya. Um, But I got to take a picture, and I'm only going to show one, not 180, but uh, you know, that's looking out in the front to the square and on, onward to, to Rome. You see the river there. Anyway, uh, it, it was so cool. And, um, and then this final picture of, uh, of Peter. And you see he's got the keys in his hand, but uh, I, I got to take that as well. And I was reminded of that this week when I was getting ready for our, our first passage because you know many believe that the apostle Peter is buried under the basilica, and you'll see why in a second. But just one more quick story is like as we were touring around, at some point our tour guide realized that I was a Protestant minister, and she's like, ooh, let me show you something really Catholic. And she did. <laughs> And it was Pope John Paul II, who is not with us anymore, but he was, he was there. He's, 
we saw him. He's in a glass thing. And anyway, I'm still a little bit disturbed by that. But anyway, moving on. We're reading from Matthew chapter 16, where Jesus asked his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? That's our big question for today. That's the number one. And if we can get that one, the rest of it will fall into place. Jesus asked, who do people say that the Son of Man is? Well, they said, some say, John the Baptist. Some say, Elijah. And others say, Jeremiah or one of the other prophets. Fair. That's what people were saying, right? But then he asked them, but who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. And Jesus replied, you are blessed, Simon, son of John, because my father in heaven has revealed this to you. You do not learn this from any human being. Now I say to you, you are Peter, which means rock. And upon this rock, I will build my church and all the powers of hell will not conquer it. The Father anointed the Son. God appointed Jesus to this position. He is our King, as we were just singing. Christ is the head of the church, which is his body, that's us. He is the head. This is his church. Cross Point belongs to him. As we look into Christ's plan for building his church, we're going to see how Jesus makes us fit together perfectly for his plan. First, we get clear on who Jesus is, right? First, we get clear on who Jesus is, and then he makes it clear to us who we are and why we are here. A.W. Tozer once said, what comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. Think about that. What comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. I think we were just there in a, in a powerful moment of worship, sensing his presence, and our mind is, is really uh, caught up in who, who is this one that is worthy of our praise? Who is he? Why is he worthy of our praise? The thoughts that come in are the most important thing about us. Jesus asked, what do people say? And their response, some say, and they filled in the blanks. But the question he has for them, the question he has for us today is, what do you say? Simon Peter declared, you are the Messiah, son of the living God. Recognize that first there's Peter's you are, and then there's Jesus's you are. The identity of Jesus, then the identity of Peter. This rock, Jesus, Jesus is the rock. That statement, the statement, Peter's declaration is the rock. Peter, Jesus transforms Simon into Peter, a rock. And we read this also in John, just two quick verses, where Andrew went to find his brother Simon, and he told him, we have found the Messiah, which means Christ. Messiah, right, is a Hebrew term, and Christ is the Greek term, but both of them mean anointed one. And then Andrew brought Simon to meet Jesus. Looking intently at Simon, Jesus said, your name is Simon, son of John, but you will be called Cephas which means Peter. The name Cephas are Aramaic and, and Peter, Greek. They both mean rock. From Simon to Peter. From Simon really means reed. It, picture it in the water, something that can easily be bent or flow, to a rock, something solid and stable. From weak to strong, there's a transformation. And so the three things I want us all to be clear on today is who is Jesus? That's God's identity. Who are we? That's our identity and then what do we need to do next? That's our purpose. Part of our purpose comes from the Great Commission. We know this, that's the last few verses in Matthew's gospel. Matthew 28 reads, and it's after the resurrection, the 11 disciples left for Galilee, going to the mountain where Jesus had told them. And when they saw him, they worshiped him. But some of them doubted. Then Jesus came and told his disciples, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you. And be sure of this, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. 
Did you notice the sandwich that Jesus makes for us? Authority and always with us. So you know everything else is going to taste good, right? It's going to work. You understand? So the whole go and make disciples and the baptize them and the teach them to obey. If he has all the authority in heaven and on earth, which just to the layman is everywhere, and if he's going to be with us always, even to the very end, everything else is going to work. That's why we're here today. So if Jesus has all the authority and Jesus promises to always be with us, it's going to be, it's going to be okay. We're not going alone. He is with us all of the way. He has been and he will be. So far, we've gone from the identity of Jesus to the identity of Peter. Now we're going to go from the purpose of Jesus to the purpose of the church. That's us. We started with Peter. Now we're going to move on to Paul in Ephesians 4. I've read this, I don't know two dozen times in the last couple months. Now, these are the gifts Christ gave the church, the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and teachers. Their responsibility is to equip God's people to do his work, to build up the church, the body of Christ. And this will continue until we all come to such unity in our faith and knowledge of God's Son that we will be mature in the Lord, measuring up to the full, complete standard of Christ, then we will no longer be immature like children. We won't be tossed and blown about by every wind of new teaching, think Simon the reed into Peter the rock. We will not be influenced when people try to trick us with lies so clever they sound like the truth. Instead, we will speak the truth in love, growing in every way more and more like Christ, who is the head of his body, the church, and he makes the whole body fit together perfectly. As each part does its own special work, it helps the other parts grow so that the whole body is healthy and growing and full of love. My responsibility as a pastor is to equip God's people to do his work, which is to build up the church. That's the body of Christ. The responsibility is to equip God's people to do his work to build up the church, the body of Christ. It's God's people, it's Christ's body, it's his work, and it's his church. So to clarify, God's gift to the church is my responsibility to this body to equip you through my teaching and pastoring. I'm to shepherd, lowercase, under the good shepherd. I am to teach, lowercase, under the teacher. I'm to lead under the leadership of the head of the church, Christ. It's Jesus. It's, this is his church. And many of you have heard me joke before about being a, a professional Christian. I think sometimes pastoral ministry uh, can, can be seen as that. It's like, oh, you get paid to be a Christian? That's kind of neat. Cool. Um, but here's, here's the clarification that, that first applies to me and then to you, is that Christian is who I am. Pastor is what I do right? Christian is who I am. It's who I'm called to be. But pastor is what I'm called to do because of a gifting and and, and a unique thing that God has stirred up in me. And so my obedience to him as a Christian is somewhat different than my obedience to him as a pastor. Does that make sense? But we're all called to make disciples. You're not off the hook. (laughs) I called you on it. It's recorded. We need God to call people into full-time vocational ministry. Of course we do. That's our our prayer. There's actually not enough people to to minister in the ways that we need. And so we need to continue to be prayerful as a church that people even in this building would be called by God to, to go into whatever it is that he has for them to the ends of the earth, of course. But we also need people just like you to feel the burden of ministry, to keep your job or to serve while retired, or or whatever status you might have. But what we need is stakeholders. We need people who can step up, feel some of that responsibility, some of the urgency and the importance of making disciples. Part of equipping you, part of my job in equipping you is to help you to grow up, to become healthy and full of love. It's my responsibility to help you mature, and this is what Paul highlights in that previous verse is, measuring up to the full and complete standard of Christ. That is high. 
growing in every way more and more like Christ. Again, that is high. So that the whole body is healthy and growing and full of love. What? Healthy and growing and full of love. I could keep repeating it. Eugene Peterson said, discipleship is long obedience in the same direction. That's what we're called to, is long obedience in the same direction. This is God's plan. We are called to follow Christ. We are called to serve. We're called to be disciples who make disciples. And this is how he builds the church, and this is how Jesus makes us all fit together perfectly. I heard a quote in the last week where Zig Ziglar once said, you don't build a business, you build people. Then people build the business. Let's build each other up. That's how God will build up the church. But it's not a business, is it? It's a family. It's not a business we work for or in. It's a family we belong to. But there are responsibilities. Earlier from that, that passage, actually just setting up the passage before that, uh, it won't be on the screen, but Paul was saying how, for there is one body and one spirit, just as you've been called to one glorious hope for the future. There's one Lord and one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and in all and living through all. Did you notice the word one? It's in there seven times. There's one body. There's one spirit, one glorious hope for the future, one Lord. I'm running out of fingers. One faith, (laughs) one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and living in and through all. We are one We're in this together, unity in Christ, unity in the church, and then unity in his mission, in that order. Unity in Christ is that one God and Father of all, that one Lord, that one spirit. We're united in him. And then unity in the church is the one body, the one faith, the one baptism that joins us with him. And then the the unity in the mission is that great commission, the helping the body grow in health, reaching people to become part of the body for one glorious hope for the future. In the last five years, I've studied and I've learned a lot about discipleship. Of course, I have in the last 20 years, but in the last five years in particular, um, it's really the, the theology and strategy of making disciples to be particular. That's what I've really been focusing on, the theology and the strategy of making disciples. And back in 2017... Um, I took a master's class at Kingswood. Dr. Bob Weitzel came up from Wesley Seminary, and the the course title was Evangelism and Discipleship. Uh, No biggie, just five full days of uh, drinking out of a fire hydrant, but, um, you know, so that was was 2017, uh, and it was amazing. And then in 2020, just before lockdown, John West was up at at District Ministerial and and a number of other things, but from talking about discipleship to the Great Commission to the secret formula, and you've probably heard me speak on that before as it comes to Coca-Cola and things like that. And then last year, about this time last year, give or take, um, our, we have these district pastor groups, pastor clusters is what they're called, and I facilitate one of a few pastors, and we pray for one another, we uh, discuss different material, we have questions and things like that. But in one of the ones for just the leaders, uh, Dr. Dan Spader got to teach us something called the, the four chairs of discipleship. It's an illustration. You've been wondering this whole time, well, what are these chairs doing up here. And so I'm going to talk about that. This is Dr. Dan Spader's, and, uh, which, is, which is great, but I'm going to fill in a little bit of my own stuff as well. So why the heck is this here? Well, you didn't know that we had skills. The first one, check this out. This is high tech, guys. This is <laughs> Flannel Graph 2022. <laughs> so this is the first chair. And how many chairs are there? Four, Four chairs. Okay. So the first chair is seeker. And the idea is that in the Gospels, Jesus has these different um, challenges, these different requests of people. And so if you think of it this way, the first one that you hear, and it's repeated in several ways, is come and see. Just come and see. Come check it out. Sometimes it's someone's brother or someone's friend. You've got to come see. I think he's the Messiah. So come and see is where it starts. That's a seeker. People often start right here. Something happens, but we'll get to that in a moment. And then what do you think the next one is? Class? Believer. Believer. Not, Stephen thought I spell, spelled this incorrectly. He thought there should be a B in there somewhere, but it's a different story. So, huh? 
Oh, okay, that's a thumbs up from Brad Perry. We're good, we're good. We're on track here. Believer, when he says, follow me, and you accept that challenge, believe, believer. That's someone in this, in this exact spot here. More on that. And then something happens here. What do you think this is? No. Worker. I'm gonna clean that off for the camera. Let's see here. Worker. This is when, yes, it's, it's still follow me, but it's follow me and I'll help you to fish for people. And, and just quickly on that, how many of you are fishermen or women? A few of you, okay. Do you do it for a living though? <laughs> One of the reasons he, he said that is because of the profession of the people he was calling. Both their profession and their skill was in, in fishing. And so insert whatever your specific skill or, or trade is here that you can use for the kingdom, but, but to become a worker. But then here's the goal. Here's, here's the journey that we're going on. And so, of course, it's come and see, follow me, follow me, I'll make you fishers of people. And then it's go and bear fruit, become a disciple maker. So you could become a disciple way over here. There's something that, that happens right here where you're like, yeah, I'm going to become a disciple. But the goal is not to stay there, but to become a disciple maker. Long obedience in the same direction. Something has to happen here. This is that, that crisis of faith. This is the crossing over the line of faith. This is the, I receive Christ as my Lord and Savior. This is the, I repent. I've been going one direction, and now I'm going to turn 180 back towards God. That's what happens right here. And, and sometimes even immediately, you're like, I'm going to get baptized. And we're going to jump in the Nashwalk. We're going to jump in the Nashwalk. We could do that today. We, we technically could. And then you get to this part, and, and then you're, you're a believer. You're someone who believes, but you're still maybe an infant in your faith. But, but for me, something happened. When this moment happened, I also knew that I was called to do these things. But some people stay right here. Hello? Some people stay right here because it's like, well, my grandfather was a Christian, and uh, I was born in this church, and uh, I'm a Christian. Even though... As disciple makers, we're supposed to help people to obey everything Christ commanded. Can you be here but be disobedient in not going forward to this chair? Or what about this one? So there's more on that. These are here for a reason. But the whole come and see, the, the challenge, of course, is, is come and see. Even just, just check it out. So someone might be here today, and we're glad you're here because someone invited you. And, and you're seeking. And hopefully, you're, you're already feeling his presence. You're already sensing that maybe God's calling you to follow me, follow him, right? And so you could move over there. But for someone who's in that first seat, what do they need? Well, we need to help them. We need to cultivate the ground. We need to help to plant. We need to help to reap what's going on there. But for someone who's a believer in chair number two, they have some different needs. Their needs are understanding their identity. That's what we're looking at today. They need to start by walking and then talking, and then we need to help by feeding them and cleaning them. And the whole idea that Dan Spader goes through there is that to know their identity, to then walk like Jesus, to then talk, tell their story, and to share God's story, to, to learn to feed themselves, not just, well, I, I came on Sunday, I, I hope the pastor gives me enough, but no, learning to read the Bible, learning to uh, talk with others about what, what it is that they need to be filled up on. Uh, to be clean, to, to be cleansed of, of everything from, from before. That's something, a work that Jesus does, of course, but to be cleansed by God and then live that way. And then chair three, the needs there, uh, the way he sums it up is to care and share. The transformation that happens in you then, then starts to move on to transforming in other people, to, to care for the people in your circle and, and to share with, with them, whatever that means. And then finally, to move on to the chair four, he calls it the steeple effect, which is to shepherd and serve and then to teach and train and then to pray and protect and then to lead and love. And notice how some of those might apply to, to me, but a, a lot of them also apply to anyone else in the room. And then you repeat the process by inviting people and so on. And so there's much more that we could look on in this in, in, in future days. But, but for now, the, the questions to just internalize is, is which chair am I in? Which chair am I in today? Ask yourself that question. And then also think about what is your next step. And then what chair are my disciples in? Or even if you have one person that you've been influencing, what chair are they in? What's their next step? Raise your hand 
if you were once invited to church, and that's why you're in church today? Raise your hand. Okay, there's a few hands. So think about that. For me, and for you that just raised your hands, I was once invited to this chair, right? One of my friends in middle school was like, hey, come to youth group. Not only that, but I'm going to pick you up at, at this time. And so I had a, a friend. It was their dad because we were in middle school. Hello. So anyway, <laughs> they picked me up, and they took me to this guy's youth group over here. Woo! We both had hair. <laughs> and that's all I'm going to say about that. But I was invited and I was also invited to camp where I received Jesus. I felt that follow me. I acted upon that follow me. And I instantly felt called into ministry. I felt like I needed to be a worker. I felt like I needed to be a disciple maker. I didn't know how to pronounce pastor or minister, but I knew that I was called to it. And so sometimes that happens in, in, a, in a really rapid way. But, but if someone wasn't invited into this spot, how could they be standing here or sitting here today? So... Your invitation matters, but the work's not done at an invitation, by the way. But please start there. Please start by inviting someone, even, even thinking right now uh, of next week, of, of Tuesday morning, of, of youth group, of small group. Um, Easter's about a month away, April the 17th. Please invite someone to come and see. Please invite someone. Pray about it. Do it. You have a month. Please do it. Because something has to happen right here where God's saying, follow me, follow me. A decision, there's a gap right here that we're going to talk about. And then there's obviously a decision here of like, am I going to get off my butt and do something? Am I? And then there's something else that happens here where it's, it's not enough to just serve. You, you still believe and you still are a worker, but then you're like, no, I need to go and bear fruit. I need to help to advance the kingdom by, I can't do it alone. We need more disciples. We need more workers. And so think about that. The three gaps that are more unique to me, and this is something I... Maybe a few people have already heard me share this, um, but it's something I've been processing is, is what happens in this gap until you get to this space is I love my king, my savior, my Lord. I love my king, though. In, in the context of Messiah, we might not say that in everyday language. We, we might not say Christ in everyday language unless it's a swear, but in, in this context, we understand king, right? I love my king, but then what happens here is I love my church. More on that later. And then over here is I love my city. And obviously it goes to the ends of the earth. Obviously, if, if we love our king and, and we love our church and we love our city, we're going to love the world. We're going to care. You, just yesterday, um, the men that were at the breakfast, we got to hear from someone from 12 Neighbors speaking specifically about housing first and, and just ways of, of all different price points that we could uh, in, invest in, in someone getting off the streets. We also heard from someone from Ukraine who was talking to his father the moment that everything started going down and just said, get out now. Now, his family's okay right now, but, but one way that we can participate with them and caring for them is medical supplies. And so there, there's a way that not just caring within the city, but, but caring to the ends of the earth, we can do this. Yeah, we'll have no problem loving the world. If you love your king, if you love your church, and you love the city, it'll, it'll expand from there. You won't be able to hold it back. But here's the discipleship path, just in case it's, it's unclear. And sometimes at least the first two things should, should, should come first, and then all these other things start to happen. So the things that start to happen uh, are right around here is you got to receive Jesus. So if you're in the come and see, you're, you're seeking, and you're at least, you're at least in, in that boat, and you're thinking, what do I have to do? Well, you have to receive Jesus, and we'll talk about that. You need to get baptized. If you've ever received Jesus and you haven't been baptized, let's do it. Let's go. Um, you need to join community, not, and, and that doesn't just mean showing up to community or just being kind of around community, but show up, and that's gatherings in the church, including this one. That could be a small group. It could be participating in the Lord's Supper the next time we get to share in communion. That's communion with God and communion with God's people. Uh, then you need to give generously. You need to love and serve one another with Christ's love. As you grow, you need to share the story, as Dan Spader was saying, you know, to, to share your story and the story of the gospel. And then you need to keep going. That's long obedience in the same direction. And so here's some questions that maybe, it, whether you have a small group or, or maybe you want to start a, a fake small group at first before you have a real one, is, is to ask each other right after this, what chair are you in? 
or let someone know, what, what chair am I in? What, what chair do you think I'm in? Yeah, they'll tell you. Um, share who invited you to church. For me, it was Chris Wilson, and, and then Nick invited me to camp. And if it wasn't for them, I wouldn't be here today. Who's that person for you? Share that with someone else. Who introduced you to Jesus? Was it a parent? Was it someone in Sunday school? Was it someone at camp? Was it someone on the street? I don't know. Tell, tell your, your friends about this. And then share the story of moving from, from one chair to the next of, of God then challenged me with blank and I needed to move, I needed to act. And then who are you helping share? Who are you helping into their next chair? So if you don't have one yet, here's some examples. You're, you're, you can't be off the hook today. After church, talk to a few people. Uh, go to lunch, go to supper, go to a restaurant, go to a coffee shop, Zoom if you have to, uh, on a walk, on a drive, a bike ride, whatever. My point is to talk about this in community, and the band's about to come in a moment, and as we wrap up, the things I want you to know before we do something is that God loves you where you are. You just can't stay there. So what's your next step? Jesus is asking, who do you say I am? Is he the Messiah? Son of the living God, as Peter declared, do you believe Jesus is risen from the dead and he is alive today? Do you believe he's been given all authority in heaven and on earth? Is he your savior? Have you, have you moved from chair one to two? If not, let's do that right now. Is he your Lord? Is he your king? So the two questions that apply to all of us in the room, what chair are you in? What's your next step? What chair are you in right now, this morning? What's your next step? So the next step could be salvation. That's, that's that moment. If, if Jesus is saying, follow me, and you know you need to make a decision today, do that. It could be baptism. It could be that you've made the decision, but you haven't been obedient in, in following in that. It could be sharing your story. Maybe you haven't shared your testimony that you have received Christ. You need to do that immediately. You need to start sharing Christ's story. You need to share the gospel with other people. You need to invite people to, to church or whatever. Invite people. Think now. Pray now about who you can invite to Easter Sunday as we celebrate. You need to be growing. We need to help you understand how to read your Bible, how to pray, how to discuss with other believers. You need to be serving. We need people to serve. We shouldn't wonder if we have enough people for kids' ministry. You need to be giving. And, and giving isn't just to the church. Number one, it's to God. It's the first 10% of, of what you have. And, and then above and beyond, great. Um, you need to give. If there's, if there's a need and, and you sense a burden for Ukraine, please give in that direction. Please but be someone who gives. But ultimately, you need to become a disciple maker, which all of the rest uh, fall under that as well. And so as we end before I pray, realize he is the head. This is his church. Cross Point belongs to him, and we can trust him. We can obey him. Remember the sandwich he built for us. It's, he has all the authority, and he's going to be with us always. So everything else, I think we're going to be okay. We can join him together to build his church. Father, I thank you so much for this morning. I thank you for the powerful worship that the team led us in. I thank you for... Uh, the challenge that you've already put on me and how it's extending to literally everyone who can hear it right now. And Father, I'm just thinking everyone has a next step, but for the person who might realize they're in seat number one right now, I ask that everyone else in the room who's already a believer to pray for them right now, um, that we would get to celebrate with them. So if, if, that's, if that's you right now, I'm going to open my eyes. Everyone else is going to have their, their eyes bow, but would you indicate to me, if you've, your heart's racing, you, you've felt this pretty much all morning, would you raise your hand where you're at so I can be praying for you, I can even lead you through a prayer? If you haven't yet received Jesus, if you know he's saying, follow me, you can trust me. If you're here now, just raise your hand and I would love to pray with you and walk you through this. For anyone else who knows that there's a next step for you, I'm gonna be praying for you as well. Father, whatever it is, would you have your will among us as, as we get to know more and more who you are and to measure up to the standard that is Christ. Help us to realize we can't do that without you. We don't want to do that without you. We do pray for that fresh wind. We do pray that your spirit would be poured out upon all of us, that in this room something would be different here from March the 20th onward. We would realize understanding who you are, the thoughts that we have, 
about you. That's really the most important thing and, and the foundation of all else that if we want to get to know who we are, we get to know who made us. We want to get to know the purpose, something bigger than the thoughts we have for ourselves or the thoughts you have for us and for this church. We thank you for this family. Thank you for those that have gone before us. Thank you for those that invited us, that cared for us, that fed us, that helped us to get to this point. God, I pray that we would become disciple makers. I pray that you would help us love our church, love our city, and then love the world. I pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.